Our next keynote speaker, our distinguished speaker, Mr. Babie Yazdani, is an Iranian-American entrepreneur and venture capitalist. Mr. Babie Yazdani is the founder at Signatures Capital. Uh, he is the founder and managing partner at Kota Capital. Uh, through Kota Capital, he mentors, develops, and supports entrepreneurs in their journey of building companies. He has recently mentored entrepreneurs and invested in over 100 early stage startups. In 2001, Mr. Yazdani was named a finalist for the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the, of the Year. Mr. Yazdani founded Sabah Software in April 1997 and served as its chairman and chief executive officer from 2003 to 2013. He took the company public in 2000. Today, Sabah is the leading provider of human capital development and management solutions, serving over 30 million people from 2,200 customers across 195 countries. Mr. Bobby Azani in 2014 was ranked as number one out of more than 2,000 angel investors. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bobby Azani. Good afternoon. Um, I'm, I'm being absolutely privileged to be here among some of the best scientists we have in our country, in the United States. I'm truly privileged uh, to have an opportunity to be among the <laughs> really highly ranked. Uh, you know, so by no means, uh, uh, you know, I should be up here. I should be listening and being a good student, and as I always have been. So I'm here as a student, not as a professor. And I'm here to just share a series of thoughts. I don't really have uh, uh, any conclusion. I only have a set of facts and set of ideas to present this afternoon. Uh, someone was asking me earlier, um, you know, how many businesses have I been involved with? How many companies I have invested? I'll give you a couple of data points. I uh, have financed over 160 companies. Uh, my first company that I financed, I was 24 years old, and I think I gave up half of the money in my saving accounts uh, to invest in a company. It happens to be down the street from here, not too far from here in Orange County. The name of the company is Massimo. And um, Massimo Giochiani was a young engineer that uh, I believed in him, and I wanted to be part of his journey of building a great company. And today, Massimo, I don't know if they employ some 5,000 employees, and they have over a billion in revenue. And uh, it's great to be uh, part of that journey. So I have invested over 160 companies. I have had succeeded and failed in many occasions. Uh, those successes and failures have brought uh, tons of learning. I mean, I have learned a lot uh, to be part of the journey of creating great, great companies. Once you see that it can happen, it becomes an amazing uh, uh, sort of like a life, life journey that you want to be part of. So I continue to um, learn from my entrepreneurs. There were a series of questions people ask me is uh, one after investing in all these companies, what are the key patterns? Um, you know, what do entrepreneurs actually look like? <laughs> how, do I, how do I know who is an entrepreneur or who is the one entrepreneur that I need to finance? And uh, over time, I've put few words to describe them. So I'm going to go through them fairly quickly. <laughs> There is no arrogance about them. They are actually at the underdogs. In most of these cases, <clears throat> what really drive them is the fact that they don't see themselves as winners. They play to win, but they are, look at themselves as the underdog. They are creative. There is just... Uh, amazing spirit of creativity in them. They don't see the world with the same lenses that normal people do. They see abstractions differently. They see patterns differently. They see colors differently. <laughs> they
they just don't see the world the same way other people do. There is just this filter, there is this, this unique filter about them that there's this creative filter that they have that they can see things that other people don't necessarily see. They're resolute. I mean, they just don't give up. The, that uh, tenacity, that belief uh, that they can, you know, as an underdog, they can win, is really what's, what's drive them. And, you know, when you sit next to them, you kind of sense this energy and this vibration from these people that you don't get uh, from all normal people. They're very, very unique. Their energy levels are very, very unique. They're outsiders. Most, you, you'll be amazed uh, how many immigrants are, turn out to be great entrepreneurs because they are outsiders. Actually, being an outsider is an advantage is an absolute advantage. Not to be part of the fabric is an advantage. One shouldn't look at it as a disadvantage. It's a true advantage. They're independent thinkers. They listen to your opinion. Boy, they've got to have their own. They have their own opinions. They form and formulate their own opinions. Um, they construct their opinions. They have their own senses and that sense of independence give them the confidence and the resolute that they have. There's just this quiet confidence that's in them that just they know. They know the answer. They can see it. And most of people don't see it. <laughs> and boy, they know how to fight. I mean, um, you know, I'm privileged to uh, to work closely with Mariam, I've seen how she fights. <laughs> uh, the resolute the belief that she can change the world, and she's after it. And again, for people like me, uh, it's just a privilege to be close to them and partnering with them and supporting them. And this is last but not least. They are overachievers. They're never satisfied with the result. They are never satisfied with the result. So this, where does all of this energy comes from? Where does all of this come from? You know, there was a question whether it's in their genes or is this their upbringing? Is it, what is it about this group? By the way, entrepreneurs are everywhere and they're in many forms. Don't just stereotype them like entrepreneurs uh, in technology, I mean, I'm, I have a brother. His name is Ali Yazdani, and he's a professor at Princeton. And he's a physicist, and he's an entrepreneur. He fights for his students every day to raise money or find money so they can continue their work. So they are overachievers, and they need to win. So it's the the outcome they're looking for is the winning. Is that uh, is that sense is that uh, is that uh, amazing feeling of being a winner it what drive them it's not about money it's amazing how many of them they don't actually care about money and the, what they care about is about winning and being the winner at the end of it question was asked uh, what does not define an entrepreneur Age doesn't define it. Gender doesn't define it. The origin doesn't define it. The religion doesn't define it. The disabilities don't define it. Quite a few of them are dyslexic, actually. They are mostly are disabled. <laughs> Educations, I mean, look at Bill Gates and Larry Ellison. They never finished their universities. And lastly, their social status. Uh, doesn't really, none of these are attributes that defines an entrepreneur. You know, there are no doubt in my mind, just looking at the, the sample of unbelievable people here, there's a lot of entrepreneurs in this room, and it could be in many forms. <laughs> you know, as I said, uh, I look at my brother as a, as a physicist and a professor, and he's an entrepreneur, the way he fights 
for his students and trying to get the money that they need to continue their discovery. To me, that's an entrepreneurial spirit. Teachers can be entrepreneurs. They fight for their students all day, and the list goes on. Is everybody an entrepreneur? And the answer is no. People ask me often, can you teach entrepreneurship? Can you make people entrepreneurs? Can we produce entrepreneurs? Is this a repeatable, predictable way to teach entrepreneurship? The answer is, I don't believe the answer is a no. Entrepreneurship is not for everyone. As a matter of fact, it's quite a dangerous hobby. It's not for everyone. It's not recommended for everyone. And uh, what we can do, and I will get into it a little bit later, of how do you inspire entrepreneurship? You cannot produce entrepreneurship. You can only inspire entrepreneurship. And the next question is, what drives an entrepreneur? Is actually the change, what I found out, is the key. They're after a change. They have seen a change or identify a change, and they have decided that they want to see that change materialize and operationalize. The actual change drives them more than anything else. Leadership, they see themselves as leaders. And uh, it's interesting, though. I'm, Early 80s, um, when I left Berkeley, I joined Oracle. And Larry Ellison was my early boss. And back then, the leadership was charismatic leadership. It was a very different type of leadership. In the 90s, it evolved. It became a different type of leadership. And in the 2000s, we had all these technologies who became leaders in my industry. Very different. They were actually... Um, uh, quite silent leaders. And they were technology leaders, and that established them as leadership. So it does evolve and change, and the form of it changed. So that's another one. But in many ways, they establish themselves as leaders in a dimension, whether it's to do with charis charismatic leadership, whether it's to do with technological leadership or abstraction or abstract thinking. And there is a dimension that they want to establish themselves as as leaders. They're independent and independent thinkers. And it's what's interesting also, one other thing about them, and it's evolved even further, is that they are, they are about team first. And they do care greatly about how they surround themselves, the kind of people they can bring in. Actually, that's one of the formulaic way of success, and that's an area that I pay a great deal of attention when I write a check is to see how many people actually want to work for them. Can they attract people? Do they have the empathy and do they have the charisma and do they have the presence to bring people around them and keep them? I like the, the one, the, that bullet being selfless. It's sort of like they're in a zone, they're in a Zen state. They just in their own created universe that they're operating as if they're riding a wave that they're riding on. And uh, it's kind of, you can see it. And one of the things I do is uh, I try to spend time with them in different condition and see whether they are actually leave that zone or they stay in it or how long they stay in it. <laughs> it's fascinating to watch them. And then last but not least, they absolutely have to be giving. If you're not giving, you cannot build a team. If you're not givers, you cannot bring people together. You cannot lead people. So you have, there is a sense of giving and they express it differently. They don't express it in the same way, but they have this uh, desire to give back in, in, different, in different forms. The next question was, how do we inspire entrepreneurship? And um, it's a complex one. Um, I use the word amplifying benchmarks. Actually, entrepreneurship is about storytelling. It's about telling their stories. 
and inspiring people by those stories. You know, we don't often, in our culture in particular, for some odd reason, we don't actually celebrate business people. We celebrate poets, we celebrate actors, and we celebrate community leaders, we celebrate religious leaders, but we don't celebrate business people. And I always wonder about that. And when I came to America, what was fascinating about this country, they actually document their business leaders. They teach their students the history of their business leaders in detail. They have documented, documented the history of their businesses. And they teach people about those history. What's fascinating is they celebrate actually business leaders. If you're a business leader, people look at you in the right, in this country at least. Because they, by the way, because they don't have any, so most of them came from statuses that are not necessarily the high level social status. They are all the underdogs who've came through. They celebrate the underdogs. And that's what's fascinating about, you know, America is how well they do this. And they celebrate the success of entrepreneurs, they document the history of the successes of the entrepreneurs and the failures of entrepreneurs. And then last but not least, they teach them. This is not teaching entrepreneurship of how to put together a business plan. This is the best way if you want to know whether you are an entrepreneur or not, read the history of the other entrepreneurs. And you will get a sense, you know, there's something inside of you <laughs> that you kind of know, do I want to be one of them? And you would know. You would know. I encourage you. And uh, they, they ask the question, what is the message back? The message back is, if you don't have the capacity as a society to celebrate entrepreneurs, you're never going to inspire entrepreneurs. If you don't have it as a society, you don't know how to you know, essentially uh, benchmark uh, entrepreneurs, uh, you're not going to produce entrepreneurs. It's a conscious effort. Uh, it's no different than any other scientific discovery is to finding them, documenting them, promoting them, celebrating them, and telling their stories around them. Now that we have written the history and we've communicated that, the next question is, what, is the con what are the type of conditions that you need beyond the inspiring those entrepreneurs to achieve the outcome um, of um, what entrepreneurship is all about? Entrepreneurship, as I said, is not in a form of a business plan. It could be in many, many forms. It could be forms of a, uh, an academic, a teacher, a judge, um, you know, a physician. Uh, it's in many, many forms. Um, but more than anything else is, is this notion of failure as a badge of honor. <laughs> in many, many community societies that I have gone through is that, uh, you know, uh, once they have overcome that failure is actually not failure. Failure is an opportunity to learn is an opportunity to absorb. They get over that you know, fairly significant hurdle. So failure as a badge of honor has to be ingrained in the culture. You know, the whole notion of risk taking, I mean, uh, we talk about uh, children and how much we are more than ever we're protecting them from failures. And uh, it's, it's, it's so in, ingrained right now in our society here in America that we want to avoid failure of our children. And those very failures are going to translate to level of risk taking that one needs to ultimately be an entrepreneur. Risk capital, taxation. One of the smartest things that I've found in this country is the way we tax people and incentivize people for risk capital. And it's such a huge barrier in many societies, the fact that the tax system does not promote risk capital. And that's a, a, a very, very big deal. I mean, if you want to know 
uh, the success of failure. You can go long or short on countries by looking at their tax system. Who do they tax and what they tax? And how do they protect inheritance or not? In this country, we don't like inheritance. The movement of capital is one of the most important aspects of entrepreneurial environments. You want the velocity of capital. You want the capital to have uh, momentum to it and ultimately take risks. Regulation and government support. I mean, we are supported in this country through our tax system and through our government to take risks. The contract law, the bankruptcy law, the corporate law protects people like me to take risks. In many countries, you don't get that. Uh, boy, if you have a bankruptcy, you're done. Try it in Germany. <laughs> you cannot show up in, the, the, in any bank ever. You better find out a new country as an entrepreneur. So it's it's a fascinating uh, way that the you know the it the, it does require the governmental support, regulatory support. It does require the taxation system support to create and condition the right environment uh, for the <clears throat> for the entrepreneurs. This is my last slide. People often ask me, how do I make a decision to invest in an entrepreneur and uh, in a business? And this is my magic 5P, potential, people, product, predictability, and price. Those are the, I basically have a formulaic. I look at all those five, and uh, we've built a whole methodology around this to be able to evaluate an opportunity. But it starts with potential. And what potential is, is actually, actually sizing the size of the problem. We think it's not worthwhile to spend time on small problems. We want to go after big problems. So we want to go after big change and big problems. That's what we are inspired to do. And secondly, we look at people. We deeply look at all the characteristics that I told you about. I mean, we need to be in the um, in concert and be, be in the journey with a special people who will be able to go through this um, uh, journey of entrepreneurship, building the business. Product is by far one of the most important aspects. And there is, again, um, different areas have different characteristics, but interesting enough, in our category, um, we like products that's in a non-linear fashion, it gets more and more differentiated. And adoption creates more differentiation, learning creates more differentiation, every customer creates more differentiation, and it's a, it's a non-linear curve in terms of the barrier to the product. Predictability, we like to invest in businesses that are create predictable business model. Superior businesses are predictable businesses. <laughs> and again, there's a whole science behind and math behind what is a pre good predictable business, a bad predictable business, and how do you do that? And that's la last not least is the price, you know, and is what do you pay for it in terms of to be an investor in a company. Um, my two minutes is over. How did I do? It's time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. My thoughts is, first of all, innovation is not as entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Discovery is not entrepreneurship. Uh, so there is, we need to segregate that activity versus, as I said, entrepreneurship. Um, innovation happens in academic centers, in labs. Um, but entrepreneurship is about um, a, a human being is actually is a person behind it that gain an insight, and that insight is an unfair advantage. 
and they take that unfair advantage and operationalize it into a business. Um, you know, I talked about conditions that one needs to succeed in an entrepreneurial society. Um, I mean, the history of China for instance, the past 20 years is one of the most fascinating thing. I think they couldn't have made as much progress if they wouldn't let loose of the people who actually take all those innovation and translate it into mega companies that they do today. So the, I talked about the conditions. You can't teach uh, or you cannot produce entrepreneurs. You can only inspire people to be entrepreneurs. And that's the subtlety of it. So I think the culture of entrepreneurship and the culture of innovation could go hand in hand, but they're really separate in my opinion. And my last question, how can we as a community, uh, you know, Persians or Iranians can help uh, entrepreneurship? I think we don't celebrate, as I said, we don't document our business people, our business leaders. I mean, I don't remember. I, was, I left Iran when I was 16. I can't remember. I remember the authorities, but I don't remember uh, the business people who created industries. And I'm certain there were many great people in that country who built businesses of magnitude. So I think we need to celebrate our business people, our entrepreneurs. We have to embrace, as I told you, the badge of honor. The failure is a badge of honor. I mean, I don't know how many entrepreneur CEOs have been fired from their CEO. We call them, they, they actually got their badge of honor. <laughs> so it's, it's, I think, I'm hoping that we raise the awareness um, that, you know, in our culture, in our community, we do need to celebrate those successes. And I'm uh, happy to tell you that uh, from where I come from, Silicon Valley, we have amazing, amazing entrepreneurs that we celebrate their successes and we try to make them the benchmark and that's the start that's the start thank you thank you it was a really fantastic talk and uh, you said that you can inspire people to do <clears throat> entrepreneurship something i wanted to know was um, is there any way to raise an entrepreneur kid or educate students to be entrepreneurs because I think actually if they, if they start earlier in life, they can be better off. You know, I have, I have three sons. I have twin boys who are 21 and a younger son who is 17. So here's what I'm doing as a parent. Um, I think uh, they each have traveled with me at least 20 different countries with me during my business trips. So I took them with me when they were kids because I wanted to, them to get a sense of what I do for a living as a CEO. They had no idea what a CEO's job is. They sat in board meetings with me. They have sat into Wall Street calls when I reported quarterly earnings. And at times they were just frustrated with me, but as they have aged, they've realized what it takes to be an entrepreneur and what have you. So exposure, as much exposure as we can give them, I think, is the best we can do. Having said that, um, um, I don't believe, again, um, there is a track that you can walk through. The only way we can, do, what we can do as parents is exposure and you know, having them learn about the history and read about it. Um, I, I don't know what else to tell you. It's not a class that I can send them, it's not a... <laughs> Between the, my three, I can tell you one of them will be an entrepreneur and one would be a scientist. <laughs> I'm proud of both of them. <laughs> I'm Benjamin Haki, double efficient student at Caltech. First of all, thank you for your talk. So I have two questions. The first one is that uh, today we have lots of great innovators and entrepreneurs here. But uh, a fundamental question is that, did all of you know what you will become in the future? And did you have clear uh, insight about the future? How far was your insight, maybe 10 years, 20 years? And uh, 
actually this question is from all the entrepreneurs here. And also, are you at the place that you thought before when you were younger or not? Um, I think when I was six, um, I, uh, I had, there was an incident. I've gone back over life and figured out what are the incidences in my life that kind of led me to this place. And uh, I can tell you it wasn't genetic, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> but it was a series of accidents. So um, there, were, there were events in my life. I mean, when I left um, Iran, and um, I've never, you know, I've said about this, I've never lived in a Christian society, so I was put in a boarding school in England, and I had no idea what that environment was supposed to be, so I figured out really quickly how to survive it. But I had this urge of leadership from day one. I had this sense that I wanted to lead the groups. I had this desire to lead. I had the desire to... Um, you know, take on responsibility. I had all of those were kind of embodied in me in many ways. But what really inspired me to be an entrepreneur is really reading through and being inspired by the story of the entrepreneurs in America. I mean, I read the history because I wanted to, un I didn't understand America. And it wasn't, I didn't want to read the political version of it. I wanted to read the business version of it. And that's how I got started. I started reading through the business history. And the more I read, the more I got inspired. And that came really within. It wasn't a set of things that I did. It was just I found um, my own happiness to be in that state. Because the more I read about them, the more I inspired and I wanted to be more like them. And this is when I was 19 years old or 20 years old. And that's what drove me. And then I had the opportunity of working with some amazing, amazing people that uh, supported me. I mean, I was uh, 37 years old when I took my company public. Um, I can remember the investment banker in Goldman Sachs who trained me how to talk to investors. My boards trained me how to carry myself and build management system for my company, and many, many other people along the way who helped me. The one trick that I had is always ask for help, and I was not shy about it. And I didn't feel ashamed of asking people to help me. Actually, my second question is that uh, you mentioned not all the people can be entrepreneur. Uh, so if uh, they re uh, read uh, the culture or history of entrepreneurship and they start the uh, way that uh, successful people uh, had, then if they follow their way, can't they reach to the place that they uh, maybe? It's a really instinctive thing. It's really come from inside. Uh, the reason I said read the, through the history and be in the company of entrepreneurs because you can benchmark your own senses right. towards that and you would know whether this is what's going to drive you ultimately you know what drives you and you need to find that maybe entrepreneurship can drive you thank you okay. you're welcome so we have mr jimmy dialshot here and dr mazami last two questions one, one, one. maybe mr jimmy dialshot first and then you one, the second one either way you can Mr. Yazan, it's an honor to listen to you. I was an entrepreneur before I became mayor of Beverly Hills. But what I notice other investors do, in a matter of few seconds, they make decisions, like Shark Tank. Would you be on a show like that? Would you make decisions as fast as they do? Because I relate to everything you said about the entrepreneur, but I don't see it with them. So how do you rate them? Uh, Shark Tank. <laughs> I think, uh, I, you know, um, I don't know, I, I think uh, I, I take my, my sense of entrepreneurship um, with true sense of purpose. Supporting the entrepreneurs 
um, it has a true purpose. Uh, first of all, I don't invest in vanity. I've decided that. And it's not whether it's good or bad. I just couldn't. It wasn't driving me. I um, want to invest in the journey of the entrepreneur. So it really is not about building a product. It's about the journey of an entrepreneur. It's a very, it's two different story. Their story is about products and markets. My story is about finding those special people that I was fortunate enough, lucky enough to be part of their journey. How do I? How do you rate them? Um, how do I rate them? I think they're awfully commercial, and I get really bored watching it. Uh, okay. We have one more minute for the last question, Dr. Mazen. Yes, yes, please. Very nice talk. Uh, um, I have a question regarding uh, in the companies you invest in, how much feasibility is important for you like if it's the, the percentage of it that is fiction the percentage of it that is reality how do you weigh that mm. and um, how, how do you approach it? a very very good question <clears throat> one of the questions that i typically ask there's like four or five standard question i have when i sit down with entrepreneurs I really want to understand their history as a person. I try to understand their history. How did they get to this moment that they're in front of me? And to have a mental picture of their journey to that day is it's so important for my um, approach to supporting an entrepreneur. I need to understand their history. That's one end of the equation. The other end of the equation is that they typically have, have come to an insight. An insight is not tangible, is not feasible. Sometimes it's feasible, sometimes it's not. I call it, they have come to the trick. They have found a trick. There is a trick. There's something that, um, there's something went on that they figured out a trick, whether it's an algorithm, whether it's seeing something the way nobody else see, whether they can model something that nobody else can model. They, maybe they had just an inst instinct about an outcome or an approach. I really want to see them articulate that. Not necessarily that they have to have a proof point for it, but they have to be able to articulate um, that they have come to an abstraction to an approach, to a thinking that is original. So the authenticity and the origin of the thought to me is more important than the <laughs> viability of it. Because if it's original and authentic, I think it will take a whole journey to get the outcome. I'm smart enough to know that I don't know. If you would have seen Google the first year of their business, you would have never ever thought, and people, everybody bet against them. But what I believe that the trick that they came back with, which was this notion of um, being to really uh, show the weighting of the search based on referenceability of pages to that, was a trick. They figured out the trick, and the trick was working. And here we are. I think they have 85,000 people working for them, last time I checked. <laughs> so it's, they got to be able to articulate that abstraction well. Thank you very much. Great. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Bobby Yazani. Let's thank Bobby Yazani. <laughs>